to be with us today. I know this is an issue that you're both informed about and have a passion about. And we welcome you here and uh, for, this, uh, for this hearing, and uh, welcome to hear your remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank you and your distinguished ranking member, Mr. Hall, for the courtesy extended here today for me to present uh, my views before this very important committee. The last time I was in this room was for the uh, unveiling of the portrait of Mr. Bollert, and here we are, portrait and and Mr. Bollert <laughs> as well. And I, I join you in thanking him for his great leadership to our country and in working in a bipartisan way uh, to use science as a basis for progress in our country. I want to also join in uh, commending the witnesses who will be presenting today uh, and thank them for their extraordinary contribution to understanding of climate change. Uh, their new report confirms that climate cha change is indisputably underway and states with 90 percent certainty that greenhouse gases released by human activities are the main cause of global warming. I'm very pleased to see uh, on the wall, which in the excitement of Mr. Bowler's unveiling, I didn't see that day several months ago, uh, that you quote Tennyson, who's my favorite poet, Alfred Lord Tennyson, and it says, for I dipped into the future, far as human eyes could see, saw the vision of the world and all the wonder that would be. What a wonderful inspiration to the work of this committee. You on this committee are opening a window into our future. Looking through that window, we see a future in which global warming will reshape our planet and our society. We also see a future in which harsh, harsh consequences could be blunted by prompt action. That's the good news. This is an issue that is as immediate to the American people as their own neighborhoods and as, as global as the planet itself. It was interesting to me that on a recent visit from the Executive Committee of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, a bipartisan committee, uh, they brought forth their 10-point program for strong cities, strong families, a strong America. And point number one in the mayor's, the conference of mayors 10 point proposal was energy independence, climate change, global warming. That was their top priority. They have best practices that they in a bipartisan way are sharing with each other and instituting in their communities. Again, this is as immediate to the lives of the American people as their own neighborhoods. And again, it is as global as the planet and that more on that in just a moment. On the science of global warming, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is by far the highest in 650,000 years. Temperatures are estimated to rise anywhere from 2 degrees Fahrenheit to as high as 11.5 degrees by the end of the century. We can expect rising sea levels, more intense storms, increased drought in some areas and more floods in others, heat waves, spread of tropical diseases, and extinction of species, changes in ocean salinity, and melting ice in the polar regions, and that is already happening. The catastrophic hurricanes of 2005, Katrina and Rita, foreshadow the challenges we will face. All along our coastlines, our great cities and small towns will be threatened by rising sea levels and intensifying storms. Not only coastal areas will be affected, Inland communities will be gravely affected as well by drought and floods. Movement of climate change refugees from one country to another could increase political instability in many regions of the world. These environmental refugees are a real, real concern. Looking through the window into the future that you have opened, we also see that we can reshape our activities now and prevent catastrophic global warming. Where well, once we thought the effects of global warming would occur decades away, change is already underway. We hold our children's future in our hands, not just our grandchildren or great-grandchildren, but our own children. As the most adaptable creatures on the planet, it is time for us to continue to adapt. Scientific evidence suggests that to prevent the most severe effects of global warming, we will need to cut global greenhouse gas emissions roughly in half from today's level 
by levels by 2050. The Bush administration continues to oppose mandatory limits on greenhouse gases, restating this position immediately upon the release of the IPCC report. I respectfully disagree with the distinguished ranking member in his comments, and this is a wonderful venue for the debate, this very important committee with these very informed members. I do believe, though, uh, Mr. Hall and Mr. Chairman, we cannot achieve the transformation we need both in the United States and throughout the international community without mandatory action to reduce greenhouse gas pollution. Many of the technologies to revolutionize our use of energy are already at hand, as the distinguished gentleman mentioned, and we can develop others, waiting on the shelf or under development. Restrictions on greenhouse gas emissions will drive these technologies into the marketplace quickly and cost effectively, while simultaneously creating the next generation of good paying new jobs. In addition, we must address land use policies in the U.S. and worldwide, since the loss of forests currently contributes about 25 percent of global carbon dioxide emissions. Older forests can store more carbon while also providing fuel for biomass energy in a sustainable manner. We have a responsibility to work with countries, as the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Hall, said, with these other countries, India and China, to name two, um, who, to, and they, to work with them, for them to reduce the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That may be as important to our grandchildren and our children's future as anything we do here. The United States and China, are to two, as, as well as India, are the largest contributors of carbon dioxide emissions in the world, and it is estimated that China will surpass the U.S. in three years. We need to engage the Chinese government by working cooperatively to develop clean and renewable sources of energy. I have asked uh, the chairs of, of the committees of jurisdiction to work with their ranking members in a bipartisan way with the members of the committee uh, to develop legislation uh, on over energy environment and technology policy and to report that legislation uh, to, the, to us no later than June 1st so that we can have an energy independence global warming package by the 4th of July. This committee is way ahead of the rest. It has legislation, as has been mentioned, on the floor today and I commend you for that, uh, Chairman Gordon and Mr. Hall and members of the committee. I know that you have other issue, other legislation that relates to innovation and the innovation agenda, which is directly related uh, to this issue uh, that will help advance the technologies needed uh, to help save our planet. We hope to have legislation that will be a starting point on global warming and energy independence um, uh, soon. Again, you have taken the lead. I also want to mention that we're creating a select committee on energy independence and global warming to raise the visibility of these urgent issues and gather critical information to protect America's security. This is a national security issue. The Select Committee will not have legislative jurisdiction, but will develop a policy strategies, technologies, and other innovations intended to reduce the dependence of the United States on foreign sources of energy and to achieve substantial and permanent reductions in emissions and other activities that contribute to climate change and global warming. The Select Committee will share its findings with the legislative committees of the House and with the public, and they will make a special effort to communicate with younger Americans by using the most cutting-edge ed technologies. Young people are very concerned about the issue of global warming. It's natural because the future is theirs, and this has a big impact on the future. For 12 years, the leadership in the House of Representatives has, not, has stifled all discussion and debate on global warming. The long rejection of reality is over to the relief of members, I believe, on both sides of the aisle. We teach our children, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, members of the committee, that everything in nature is connected, and indeed it is. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament that to minister to the needs of God's creation is an act of worship. To ignore those needs is to dishonor the God who made us. This is indeed, this planet is God's creation. That's why large 
segments of the evangelical movement have become part of this effort to curb and stop global warming. We have a responsibility to make an act of worship by, by uh, protecting at God's creation. There is a growing chorus of voices, including the evangelicals, in favor of taking serious and sustained action on global warming from scientists to Fortune 100 CEOs, from evangelical Christians to environmentalists, from farmers to hunters and to anglers. We'll work together, holding hearings, developing legislation, and tackling one of America, humanity's greatest challenges yet, global warming. With that, Mr. Chairman, I uh, thank you once again for the opportunity to present my views as Speaker of the House uh, to you and to Mr. Hall with the promise uh, that we're, this is not about taking one point of view and going forward, but in trying to work in a bipartisan way for a sustainable for sustainable uh, initiatives that we can agree upon and make a difference for our children and, and uh, see the vision of the world and all the wonder that would be uh, in this important committee. Madam Speaker, thank you for joining us today.